About one half of our nation's adult population does this every night. For most, it's no problem, but for some, it can be deadly. It's dangerous for those who do three things. Snore incredibly loud, snore in any sleeping position, and literally stop breathing over and over again during the night. Doctors have found the snorer in serious trouble stops snoring up to 300 times a night for up to a minute and a half each time. But it puts a tremendous strain on the heart. And so what happens over a period of time is they start to develop heart failure. Uh, as they develop, as uh, the heart failure gets worse, they develop potentially very serious cardiac abnormalities or arrhythmias associated with that, which in most of these patients are apparent only when they're asleep. And this, of course, is a potentially life-threatening situation. 22-year-old uh, Steve Silverstein's mind, life was in danger because of his snoring. Yet for years, his habit was a source of amusement and jokes. The most memorable involves a ski trip. The bus broke down and the whole group of strangers were forced to sleep in sleeping bags on the floor of an old school building. And in the middle of the night, when I started my snoring, um, one of the... Uh, people on the trip jumped up screaming, feeling that a wild animal had gotten into the school building. and He woke everybody up and felt that we were going to be attacked. Two sessions at Presbyterian Hospital's sleep disorder clinic showed that Steve's snoring was no laughing matter. During a night's sleep, he would stop breathing nearly 400 times. The abnormal snoring pattern has taken its toll on his body. Steve has high blood pressure and his heart is larger than it should be. But hopefully his problems will go no further. Recently, Steve had an operation that tightened his soft palate, the tissue that blocks the airway and causes the snoring sound. The procedure has been very successful in providing relief to abnormal snores. But keep in mind, this is an alternative for the exceptional snorer. For the common snorer, there are other methods. There are some amazing claims of cures for the common snorer. More than 300 patents are on file for contraptions that supposedly bring it to an end. They do it all, from shocking to shaking to torture. And individuals actually come up with a device that's called a snore collar. And the snore collar fits around the neck, and it's set up with a microphone to amplify the noise that comes from snoring. And each time the patient begins a, an inspiration and starts to make a little snoring sound, it trips this device, which shocks his neck, and it shocks him. So one of the contraptions that we talked about uh, and has to do with a device that holds the tongue forward. It's called a tongue retaining device. Mm -hmm. And this is a device which actually creates a suction on the tongue and holds the tongue forward. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how many people in your audience would be willing to sleep with one of those night after night after night. I most certainly would not be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, those are rather drastic measures to stop snoring. Dr. Orr has some more subtle suggestions. Try using two pillows. The extra elevation may keep your airway open. Or learn to sleep on your side because most people only snore when lying on their back. And finally, try sewing a marble or even a tennis ball in the back of your pajamas. That will keep you off your back. Your days will be much more enjoyable and you'll be much brighter if your sleep is better. Sherry Sellers, Action 4 for Medical Matters. Andy Giles must take the long, frightening walk to the tank room twice a day. At four and a half years old, it's all very confusing. He doesn't understand why he's in so much pain, or why the people he thought were healers are herders. There's little the nurses can do. They can only soothe Andy by telling him the wretched ritual of cleansing his burns will bring a quicker end to his misery. But now, when the pain is at its highest, words aren't enough. He needs that familiar face, that hand that has always been there to hold him. Andy wants his father. I want daddy! I want daddy! But Andy's father isn't allowed to be here. Children believe that parents should save them from everything. You know, when a child's hurt, you know, you run to mommy and she'll kiss it and make it better. With a burn care, that's not possible. Parents cannot make it better. And some of the treatments just has to be done. Plus the fact, if the parents in that room 
supporting nursing staff doing the mean nasty things, then that's changing the child's viewpoint of that parent. That you're not saving me, you're giving them to me. So this way we can make the parents still the good guy. You know, we can let the parents play with them and do all this and we can be the bad guys. There are many parents who simply wouldn't want to be in the burn center tank room even if they could. They just can't push themselves through the door, knowing on the other side their child is lying there, crying, because the pain is too much to bear. Andy's parents are still in shock from the accident itself. Their little boy was building a fire in the backyard. He left and brought back a bottle of denatured alcohol. Moments later, there was an explosion, and Andy was rushed to the hospital. His family is now trying desperately to stay strong, despite the tragedy. For Andy's father, that means taking care of everyone, from mom to child. But in a way, it's good for him, because it keeps him busy. I guess it helps to have a wife when that goes to pieces sometimes, so I can help hold her together and forget about myself. Mm -hmm. While I'm at the hospital, I hold his hand and talk to him and do what I can, you know. Just not much you can do when they're in pain like that. Parents like Jerry Giles need someone to lean on while their shoulders are being used. That someone is the nurses who are helping his son. Theirs is a job of many hats, healer, counselor, and listener. But they realize the key to this little boy's recovery is his parents. So at the Oklahoma Children's Memorial Burn Center, there is a circle of support. Its links of doctors, nurses, and parents stand strong in hopes that every tiny patient will walk down this hall straight out the door to home. Sherry Sellers, Action 4 for Medical Matters. young man. Hey Chris. Okay, Jim, would you and Angie walk Chris around back and yeah. stay with him, okay? okay? For seven years, Joy Milligan has been welcoming handicapped children to Coffee Creek, a special place where an inch of effort becomes a yard of advancement. Here, the word disabled doesn't exist. Each of these children, no matter how handicapped, will learn today that they too can share the pleasures of life by just trying. Got an idea which one you think will fit? Which one? Which one's cute? Want to try that one? Okay. Try that one. What do you think? Is that too loose? Part of the fun that inspires at Coffee Creek comes with the rituals of riding. The hat is much more than a costume. There you go. Uh oh. It's a uniform of belonging. Is that just right? That's right. That's right. All right, you ready to go? Ready? Okay. Are you ready, Chris? Yeah, come on. This is what the children look forward to week after week, that moment when they climb the ramp to climb on their horse. When you stand only four feet tall, it's pretty exciting to touch and ride a gigantic creature, very much alive with a mind of its own. All right. Now we're gonna take hold of our stirrup here. Perhaps that's the magic that makes this program work. Up you go, step right on. All right, good job. Have All you ever right. been on a horse before, Chris? Yeah. You did a good job. So it's just almost a mystique of attraction between horse and student. And we'll get students in that won't even talk to a volunteer, and they make a relationship with a horse, and then it builds to the volunteer. So there's just an attraction with a horse that makes it work. The children that ride here at Coffee Creek sit tall and proud in their saddles, pumped up with a new self-confidence. That psychological lift is important, especially to these kids who suffer from mental handicaps. But the physical workout is needed just as much. Both hands. Catch. Good. Catch. Got the ball. Shoot right over here. Put it right up in there. Wow! wow. All right. Catch it again. Okay, put right it in inside there. the basket. Right inside. Perfect! All right. All right. The success of this center isn't measured by the number of riders that pass through. Instead, it's measured by change. I just like to see every individual keep working toward that potential that they were made to be. And to me, it's exciting, especially if a student comes out looking very dull and begins to wake up and get excited and get in with the program and learn his right and left. And that excites me to see them progressing and learning that they can do. They're not disabled, they're able.
Linda Duncan falls in love with every family she helps. That's why she's waged this battle of dollar versus pain for them. Hmm? You gonna be a nurse with me today? Don't know where Too many is? times in her young life, you Linda's had you to walk into a room you filled needlessly with pain and suffering. Let's go see grandma. A room that could have been cleared of the hurt grandma. if only there had been money. Somehow, in the terrible world of terminal Where's illness, grandma? peace has claimed a cost. Hi, how its you price doing? is expensive doing drugs. Today. You look great. Oh, I feel better. Mildred Kennedy was lucky. She was able to afford the luxury of dying in peace. If it's possible to put a dollar value on something so priceless, Mildred's payment was in the thousands of dollars. Her daughter Carol remembers well the 24-hour family vigils to give Mrs. Kennedy her medicine. In this home, clocks were set by medication time. Never could a dosage be missed, and there were 28 a day. But it was all worth the comfort of mother. A comfort not available to those who are sick and penniless unless hospice helps. It will mean the difference between despair and hope. It will mean the difference between enjoying each day and living each day to the fullest and laying there in a state of, of constant agony. What we're seeing here is like a war situation. Uh, if, if we were in the middle of uh, Vietnam War and we saw people laying on the sides of the roads with their guts blown out, it might upset us. Well, what we're really seeing is people laying in their bedrooms in that shape. But it's just that uh, we, it's just so much easier to shut our eyes and pretend it doesn't exist. In another bedroom on the other side of Oklahoma City, Frederick and Ollie Perry are counting their blessings. So far, they've been able to find the funds to buy those precious drugs that make Frederick's life and death easier. But each month, the couple must reach deeper and deeper into their pockets. Soon, they'll be empty. A lot more than I can afford, but I just have to do it anyway. Uh, I uh, always spend over $200 a month on this uh, medication. And uh, you can see that uh, that's where the money goes. And uh, I'm not able to do it, but I just do it anyway and let something else go to do it. I still have to have that medication no matter where. What happens, I still have to have it. It's one of those towns you could pass through and never notice. But to the people of Binger, it's home. And there's just no place they'd rather be. Sure, there are things that could be better. But sometimes the old and traditional add a touch of spice to life that could never be found in the new. The tiny town ceremonies and the forgotten family life where everyone helps all add a touch of fantasy to this picture book place. But a few years ago, it would have taken only one tiny accident to shake this sleepy community of its security, because Binger had no doctor. But how does a town of 800 attract a good doctor? There's not lots of money to be had here, or medical advancements to be made. The town of Binger has but one thing to offer its medicine man. Patients who return every cherished ounce of care with a pound of honest friendship and respect. Let's look and see if you've got a bird in your ear, okay? Ooh. Okay. This doesn't hurt, it tickles though. All right? Let's look. This won't hurt. You can hold your hand on there, that's all right. Ooh. Did you hear the birdie? Fate found the perfect physician right under the noses and ears of Binger's patients. A man capable of turning a child's fear of medicine into magic. And ironically, Doc Bob had been there all along, just hidden under another name, good old Bob the Pharmacist. It took only a little encouragement from the town to persuade Bob Holsey to complete his schooling and become a doctor, because already he yearned for the feeling of accomplishment that would come each day as a physician. And All now right. he has it. In less than a year, Doc Bob has developed a practice any small town would be proud of. He told me, he says, now, he says, I'm not just open from 8 to 5. He says, if you need me at 2 or 3 or 4 in the morning, call me. And, you know, you don't find that very often. Yeah. To me, that means everything. 
It takes a special kind of doctor to work in a rural area, one that doesn't mind sacrifices, because the patients here expect not only extra time, but extra attention. Doc Bob does more than that. He becomes a friend, someone to trust. And when you need him, he will be there, even if it means a house call. We have no nursing home. Many of these people want to stay at home and, and, and be in their community. And so when they're really ill and they are homebound and can't get out, if it's something that can be managed at home, then we try to manage to get by to see them. Hello, Jeff. Huh? How you doing? I'm doing okay. It's neat to, uh, to be able to, to know my patients on a first name basis and they call me Dr. Bob or Bob to see them on the street and to, to live with them and care for them just like everyone else in the community works and cares for the others. It's unique. The people of Binger have found a one-of-a-kind doctor and Doc Bob has found a one-of-a-kind life. Sherry Sellers, Action 4 for Medical Matters. For 14 years now, Dr. Dale Hall has been walking into the lives of troubled denture wearers. Irene, how you been doing? Just fine. Irene McBroom couldn't be happier. When she first sat in this chair, she was having terrible problems with her dentures. They were constantly sliding, making it hard for her to talk and eat. But now, thanks to implantology, the sliding has stopped because a permanent base has been embedded in her gums. Her false teeth now hook onto these posts, making them stable. Irene says she feels like she's been given back her natural teeth. I can just eat anything I want to eat now. I can even eat nuts, and I couldn't eat, and I couldn't eat steak. And I just, uh, for years, I wouldn't go out to eat because I just couldn't, you know. Now it's no problem at all. Dr. Hall's convinced that the majority of today's denture wearers share Irene's suffering. He says for those with loose dentures, every day is a constant fight against discomfort. We're at war to a certain extent with ourselves when we wear a lower denture. We're trying to balance it with our lower lip on one side and the tongue on the other side. And subconsciously, we're aware that denture is in there all the time. We're past that stage in dentistry today. Mm -hmm. We're in a living in a different area. We can anchor teeth in, we can anchor one tooth, we can anchor many teeth, or we can anchor a whole set of dentures in the mouth. And people can chew with them with comfort. As with any surgical procedure, the comfort comes after a certain amount of healing pain. Ruby Wingard wasn't looking forward to the soreness, but she knew the pleasure of chewing was well worth the hurt. There is a time that uh, everything isn't roses, you're going to suffer a little, but it's worth the suffering. When you get over it, you're very pleased. You can have what you want to eat and you can eat it. There is a group of dentists who fear the pain of the procedure may be topped by the pain of infection. It's the American Dental Association and its members have not yet backed this treatment wholeheartedly. Dr. William Brown is the dean of the OU College of Dentistry. He says the risk of gross infection is definitely a factor, but one must weigh that risk against the benefits. They should ask the questions. Why is it to my advantage to have this type of treatment? And at what risk might I be? What do I need to do to really look after these things? How can I assure that they will last for a good many years? What do I have to do? And then once they have asked the right questions, then they can decide by weighing the pros and the cons and then making an intelligent decision. Dr. Dale Hall and his colleagues are working hard to educate the members of the American Dental Association on implantology. This day, dentists from Texas and New Orleans were present for over-the-shoulder lectures. Hall feels sure that in time, implanted dentures will be as common a treatment as a filling. Sherry Sellers, Action 4 for Medical Matters. At first glance, this trauma center could easily be mistaken for an emergency room. There are patients being brought in by ambulance through the side doors and people walking in sick through the front doors. 
But the difference comes not in the patient being placed in the room. It comes in the care. Um, did you see your x-rays? No. Let me show them to you. All right. Looks like... Henry Davis just happened to be working close to OMH when his hand slipped into a running table saw. He had no idea this was a trauma center. It looked like an emergency room to him. So you caught it in a table saw? Mm -hmm. That oversight was a stroke of luck for Henry. Only at a trauma center is a full medical team available 24 hours a day. Surgeons, neurologists, and anesthesiologists are all in-house ready for an emergency. Even equipment has been sterilized beforehand to save sacred time. Dr. Robert Wilder, chief of the center, says for some 70 Oklahomans a year, these people and their preparations will mean the difference between life and death. If you had a knife wound in your chest, would you want to stop at a hospital where the chest surgeon was 30 minutes away and where your heart might be bleeding, uh, or would you rather go to the hospital where your chest surgeon is in the hospital or a member of his team is in the hospital 24 hours a day? And that's what every trauma center tries to achieve. And okay, you ready? Hang on. Mm. Uh-huh, I know. Boy, you said... In any medical emergency, there is pain. At least in a trauma center, the hurt is dealt with quickly. Within minutes, an examination room changes into an operating room. An emergency doctor turns into a surgeon. The key to the success of this center is response time, and it must turn over and over again. 40,000 patients a year lie on these beds. That breaks down to 150 a day. But that's expected of a trauma center. The workload will come, and it will be met. And thanks to that 24-hour dedication, patients like Henry Davis will be back on their feet again before they know it. Sherry Sellers, Action 4 for Medical Matters. There. On the top line. Mike Brown yeah, has taken this well, test at least eight, a dozen times before, two, and each time he's failed 20 it. 20 on the second line, 2 and 20 on the second line, 21, and then I can't see a thing. Okay. Mike's no, colorblind. He can't color. distinguish shades uh, and yes, tones of reds and greens. Okay. It's a problem that causes no pain, that? but it is okay. terribly inconvenient. Is For Mike, there may be a simple answer to his color deficiency. When he holds a red filter to his eye, there's a remarkable change. In front of your eye. Oh, it's 71. Okay. This vivid eyesight can be Mike's for good with the help of a kind of miniaturized red filter in the shape of a contact lens. It would mean no more missed traffic lights and no more mix-matched wardrobes. Both are problems Mike's faced almost all of his life. Yes, even as a child, color had its place and importance. Well, when most kids draw colors and, you know, and they come home from school and they try to think, gosh, isn't that a beautiful picture? My, my parents never made a comment about any of my pictures because <laughs> they were all, <laughs> the colors never worked out right. You know, and, and then when you used to tell them this is a red crayon or a green crayon or a certain color, I couldn't tell you what color the crayon was. I didn't even know. So it's a real, it's a real predicament. And I think, you know, we laugh and joke about it now, but it, yeah, I think it can, it can cause some kids, I'm sure, problems. Now Mike must make a decision that could change his adult life. Is the wonderful world of color worth a little less attractiveness? You see, the corrective red contact lens will definitely be noticeable in this patient's baby blues. Uh, the red lens is a necessity to make it work. Uh, somebody with very light uh, uh, eyes, uh, blue eyes, it's usually fairly apparent the, of the lens being on the eye. At the same time, we can put a brown lens on the other eye and usually uh, uh, make it cosmetically attractive. It just looks like you have brown eyes instead of uh, having blue eyes. If you're not concerned with the cosmetics of corrective contacts, this could be the perfect solution for not-so-perfect eyesight. The red lens cost about $400, and they're no harder to care for than regular contact lens. But best of all is the colorful world that awaits you outside your optometrist door. Okay. Sherry Sellers, Action 4 for Medical Matters. Oh, yes, gosh, this is the first time in my life I can see some colors. When you're
your kidneys are no longer working, this is your line to life. The dialysis, a kind of man-made washing machine for the blood. To Florence Greer, it's a chore that's a savior. Without it, she has no doubt she wouldn't be alive. But with it comes a tiresome routine of visits that pass daily, turning weeks into years. Since 1977, Florence has had to depend on the dialysis to do the job of her kidneys. She's become complacent about the trips to the hospital and the hours of sitting in one chair, moving only one arm. But now, when Medicare threatens to take it away by making her pay more and more of the cost, she loses that don't care anymore attitude. I just don't think that they should cut it, you know, and uh, because just like I say, the machine is expensive and you can't live without it. And somebody's got to pay for it, you know, because if you don't take your treatment, you know, you, you just soon to die, you know, right quick. It's saving my life so far, and I couldn't do it without it till I get it. Wanda Mowdy has had money on her mind for some time now. The new cuts have only scared her more. She's doing all she can to fight the high cost of her kidney disease. In fact, if not for an emergency, she wouldn't be here in the hospital. Because for cheapness, Wanda now takes dialysis at home on a portable unit. It's a measure lots of patients are taking, trying to make ends meet. But they're caught in a circle of getting ahead, just to fall behind because of cutbacks. Wanda says the future is frightening for those who share her disease. What happens when all that's left to cut is the machine that can cut your life? Many of the uh, cuts will cut deep into the bone and not just trim away fat. That the concern over dialysis cutbacks goes past the patients and their families. Hospital administrators and doctors have their worries too. The man in charge of dialysis at the Baptist Medical Center wonders about units that have cut all they can in material cost. Being forced to cut again could jeopardize the survival of the facility. This means a decrease in staff, either cheaper staff who are less well trained or fewer staff. And this uh, is a danger that we will not perform dialysis as well uh, if we get into that point. And what happens when the staff has been cut? Uh, then you'll either have to cut the number of patients and uh, there there is a danger of people not having uh, dialysis facilities available when they need them or uh, they'll not get adequate care. This is Sherry Sellers coming up on Action 4's Medical Matters, a Medicare cutback that recipients fear will cut lives.